the prizes They're deadly disguises We're counterfeits of Yahoo's perfect plan The church gives no rebuttal Cause she is so subtle So subtle she can lure the strongest man In the book of Kizayon, the Revelation, in chapter 13, in verse 1, we read, And I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads names of blasphemy and we are going to examine these names of blasphemy in a moment that are worn upon this beast this beast according to the prophet Daniel in the scriptures is the Roman beast and we're I'm going to explain and, and uh, break that down in just a moment however this beast the Roman beast which rises these names of blasphemy, remember, blasphemy brings reproach against the name of Yahuwah. And that is what this beast is doing. And that is what is upon its heads. And remember, it has seven heads and ten horns. And we're going to break all that down in just a moment. In verse 2, And the beast I saw was like a leopard. The leopard is in the book of Daniel. It is the Grecian Empire. The Grecian Empire was represented, and we're going to look at it in a moment, as a four-headed leopard. And this dragon, this beast that rises up out of the multitude of the people, it is a seven-headed beast. It is the Roman beast. And I know that most of you have probably heard the phrase, Greco-Roman, which refers to the time frame of the celebration of the Greco-Roman Empire, in which Greece had been dismantled and had been absorbed into the Roman beast, and the Roman beast celebrated the Grecian culture. Okay? They, they shared... Most of the same mighty ones just renamed with the exception of one mighty one that they called Apollo, which we will talk about pretty extensively later on in this video. However, they shared the same culture, they shared the same religion, okay? So we see that this beast that was likened to a leopard is the Grecian beast, uh, I mean, this beast that was likened to the leopard is the Roman beast, which is like unto the Grecian beast. And his feet were like the feet of a bear. And the bear, in the book of Daniel, is Media Persia. So the feet, the feet is what gives you stability. The feet is what you use to conquer and to trample and to walk and to march to war. And that is the Media Persian Empire. We're going to get into some more information about that in a moment. And his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And Yahushua, our master, our teacher, our Messiah, spoke that the mouth speaks what is according to the abundance of the heart. So the abundance of the heart of this beast, of this nation that rises up, the Roman nation, the latter time Roman beast, the heart of it is Babel. And remember what we said about Babel, about Nimrod who created the Migdal, Babel, the word Migdal meaning a tower but also meaning a stronghold, and Babel meaning mixture and confusion. He was the author of mixture and confusion on the earth and he provoked the Most High to change the languages of the people in which they were dispersed and went their own way and kept that religious, political system 
in every single culture of the, the pagan world, you will see the same similar pagan cultures and celebrations. You will see it all comes from Babel and at the heart of this beast which is where it speaks according to its mouth. It is Babylon. It is mixture. It is confusion. It is speaking one thing and doing another thing. It is being hot and cold at the same time. And the dragon, who is Shatan, Satan, gave him his power and his throne and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as having been slain to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the earth marveled after the beast, one of its heads, one of its provinces, which houses a king, would receive a deadly wound, which means, according to the book of Daniel, again, which is a fixed interpretation, a fixed scriptural interpretation and analysis that we're going to give you in just a moment, where Daniel proves this. It receives this deadly wound, and what this means is that the king of this empire, and that this empire itself, would cease to exist for a while, for a season, but that it would be healed. And it said, And I saw one of the heads as having been slain to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the earth marveled after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to fight with him? The word worshipped here, when you look it up, it means to bow yourself, to prostrate yourself. It also can mean to kiss the hand, and you will see surely the entire world kisses the hand. The entire world does obeisance. The entire world prostrates itself to the power in Rome, in the Vatican, Every single tribe and every single nation and every single tongue is represented and it has been subdued by this power, the power of the Roman beast. And it says, who is able to fight with him? In verse 5, he was given a mouth speaking great matters and blasphemies. And he was given authority to do so for 42 months. Remember, 42 months. 42 months correlates with what you have probably heard as the three and a half years of tribulation, which is indeed a time of three and a half literal years, but also the time of 1,260 days, which is... In fact, it's three and a half years, but also represents 1,260 prophetic years, which was to transpire. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies and reproaches against Elohim to blaspheme his Shem, his name, and his tent, and those dwelling in in the heavens. And we know that this beast indeed blasphemes the name, that it indeed has persecuted and is guilty of shedding the blood of those who have called upon this name. And so is the whore that sits on the beast, which we will talk about a little later, and his tent and those dwelling in the heavens. And it was given to him to fight with the set apart ones, and to overcome them, and authority was given to him over every tribe and tongue and nation. It was given to him to fight against the set apart ones. Now, when you think of set apart ones, take your mind to the man who wrote this book, Yahu Kanan, who has been called John. In the very first chapter, you will read that he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, and he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos by the Roman Empire. 
It says that this beast would have dominion over every tribe and over every tongue and nation. And authority was given to him over every tribe and tongue and nation. Here we are talking about a global power. We're talking about a one world beast, a beast, a nation, a conglomeration, a conglomeration of different nations that have come together that create a one world global system in which it can rule the entire world. That is what is being talked about here. And of course, most of you are already familiar with this concept, this globalized agenda which is being pushed today. Globalization is no longer a theory that is called a conspiracy. No, my friends, globalization is on your magazines, it is in your newspapers, it is on the tongues of your presidents, it has been on the tongues of individuals throughout the years all the way back again to the Tower of Babel who was the originator of the concept of globalization other than the actual fallen ones themselves and Shaitan who actually put this into the uh, minds of mankind. <laughs> We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind. Peace and security, freedom and the rule of law. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective, a new world order, can emerge. 1945 and the end of the war through 1989 and the end of the Cold War, we had a worldview. Republican and Democratic presidents alike, from Harry Truman to George Bush, stood for freedom and stood for certain propositions that would make America strong and healthy and grow the middle class and shrink poverty and stand against communism. And after 1989, President Bush kept said, and it's a phrase that I often use myself, that we needed a new world order. We needed a new world order. He wills. We have confidence because freedom is the permanent hope of mankind. The hunger in dark places the longing of the soul. When our founders declared a new order of the ages, a new order of the ages, a new order of the ages, died in wave upon wave for a union based on liberty. The way we're going to win over the long term is not just militarily, we've got to win over uh, hearts and minds. And what that means is we've got to invest in countries that uh, have no educational infrastructure, have no uh, means for young people to, to get ahead. We've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, uh, world order, uh, world order, uh, world order, I think. What do you think the most important thing is for Barack Obama? Obviously, you're here to talk about uh, the anniversary for U.S.-China diplomatic relations, but if you had to say this is going to be the country or the conflict or the place that will define the Obama administration, what would it be? Well, the, 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 the president-elect is coming into office at a moment when there are upheavals in many parts of the world simultaneously. You have India, Pakistan. You have, you have uh, uh, the uh, jihadist movement. So he can't really say that it's one problem, that it's the most important one. Uh, but he can give a new impetus to American foreign policy, be partly because the reception of him is so extraordinary around the world. 
I think his task will be to develop an overall strategy for America in this period when really a new world order can be created. It's a great opportunity. It isn't just a crisis. Are you confident about the people uh, President-elect Obama has chosen to surround him because he does not have a great deal of experience? No, he's, uh, he has appointed an extraordinarily able group of people in both the international and financial field. Mr. Secretary, we thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. President Obama and British Prime Minister Gordon today calling for a new world order to tackle our global economic crisis. President Obama said globalization can be an enormous force for good. Prime Minister Brown again pushing for what he calls a global new deal. The U.S. presidential motorcade arrives at the United Nations, passing the ever-present groups of demonstrators assembled on the other side of the road. A sense of anticipation in the General Assembly chamber and a warm reception for Barack Obama as he walks to the podium his wife seated among the heads of state and dignitaries. The time has come for the world to move in a new direction. We must embrace a new era of engagement based on mutual interest and mutual respect. And our work must begin now. And the president outlined his vision of a new world order in which the U.S. would participate fully, one rooted on four basic principles. Non-proliferation and disarmament the promotion of peace and security, the preservation of our planet, and a global economy that advances opportunity for Yet all Yet these problems can be overcome by a joint effort in our, and between our countries. 2009 is also the first year of global governance with the establishment of the G20 in the middle of the financial crisis. The climate conference in Copenhagen is another step towards the global management of our planet. Our mission, our presidency, is one of hope, supported by acts and by deeds. The haves and the have-nots is a message long central to the Catholic Church. Now the Vatican is picking up on the momentum and speaking out against what it calls the idolatry of the market. For the first time, the Vatican has outlined what it sees as a moral fix for the problem of poverty, a proposal to create a new financial authority, including a global central bank and a new tax on global financial transactions. Globalization has made us all uh, in, in the same boat, and we're going to either sink together or, or we're going to prosper together. But we're only going to do that if we work together as a world community to deal with these issues. The Vatican says the International Monetary Fund has lost the ability to stabilize the world financial system and points to the current debt crisis in Europe and the lingering effects of a global recession. <laughs> And it says in verse 8, And all those dwelling on the earth, all those dwelling on the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life, of the slain lamb from the foundation of the world, shall worship him. Now you remember in the book of Malachi where we read in the latter times, Malachi chapter 3 verse 16, that Yahuwah would be listening and he would hear all those who were meditating and thinking upon his Shem, his name, and that he would write a book with their names in it and that they would be his and they would be a treasured possession. And because they had done this, because they had meditated and thought upon his Shem in the latter times, that in those times we would again see the difference between the righteous and the wrong, between those who serve Elohim and those who do not serve Elohim. Keep this in mind. And here we see that this book is none other than the book of life of the slain lamb. Now, let me take your minds back to what we said about the great seal of Yahuwah. Yahuwah's name made up of the four letters that are words in the abrit Hebrew language, Yad Hawaha, or you have probably heard it called Yod He Wah He, 
which means in the Hebrew language, hand, behold, nail, behold. And again, you see the pattern that this reveals the pattern of the slain lamb of Yahuwah. It shows the man who is with Yahuwah, the image, the milta of Yahuwah, the, the, the muth, the likeness that was with him in the beginning, that it goes through the nail, which brings unity, and it also brings division amongst people, which is what the name does. It does divide and it sets apart. It brings you to a set of a, a, a lifestyle of uh, walking in the Ruach HaKodesh, which is a Kadosh, a set apart lifestyle. So it brings this, but it also shows the travail that the Mashiach would go through, the suffering that he would go through, and it shows that he resurrected. So it shows that he was slain through the nail, and that he resurrected, and that he fulfilled the name of Yahuwah. Hallelujah. And then it says in verse 9, If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Emphasis. He who brings into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword has to be killed with the sword. Here is the endurance and the belief of the set-apart ones. This is Torah. This is eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And again, this is the endurance, the belief of the set-apart ones. That he who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. There must be vengeance, and vengeance is Yahuwah's. Yahuwah says, vengeance is mine, saith Yahuwah. So we know that this will transpire, but you have to, to remember this when we continue on into the interpretation of this beast which again, this vision, which the Christian church has labeled as a mystery and tried to, uh, to avoid teaching on and explaining or touching or anything, and the people of the world have been confounded by this metaphor, this has been revealed in the latter times, and I'm not the first one to reveal it. There are many people in the earth who know what this is because it is so obvious because it is revealed again in the book of Daniel. All you have to do is know your scriptures. But the problem is, is that people don't know their scriptures. They don't study their scriptures in these latter days. They're spiritually ignorant and they avoid these kind of things because they think that this is beyond their understanding. This is for a time that is to come. But no, my friends, this this is happening all around you. It has happened around you. It is history, and it proves the inspiration that the Ruach Yahuwah had on the men who wrote the scriptures and penned them in the original text. Hallelujah. Let's go to the prophet Daniel in the Tanakh, which has erroneously been called the Old Covenant. It is the covenant of Yahuwah. And Yahuwah has renewed His covenant with His people through His Ben, His Son, Yahushua HaMashiach. Hallelujah. In Daniel chapter 2, we go to Daniel chapter 2 and we're going to start in verse 27. Daniel is in the Babylonian exile here and there has been a vision that has been received by Nebuchadnezzar, who is the sovereign of Babel, that has been called Babylon. And the vision was so startling to Nebuchadnezzar, and he knew it was such of significant importance, that there was a decree put out into Babel that all the wise men, the astrologers, the soothsayers, the magicians, the warlocks, all the various witches, and all the various different types of Babylonian magic, that they should all be put to death, if not one of them could relate not only the interpretation of this startling vision, this startling dream that Nebuchadnezzar received, but they also had to reveal the very dream and explain it in detail. And not a man could do it amongst the soothsayers and the witches and the warlocks and those who practice divination and those who used charms and those who celebrated times and seasons and those who did all these things. Not one could do it. And they say that it was an impossible thing that the king had asked. Now let's pick up in verse 27. 
Daniel answered before the sovereign and said, The secret which the sovereign is asking, the wise ones, the astrologers, the magicians, and the diviners are unable to show it to the sovereign. But there is an Eloah in the Shemayim who reveals secrets, and he has made known to sovereign Nebuchadnezzar what is to be in the latter Yamim, or days, your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O, so o Sovereign, on your bed your thoughts came up. What is going to take place after this? And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what shall be after this. As for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes, who make known the interpretation to the sovereign, and that you should know that the thoughts of you should know the thoughts of your heart. You, O sovereign, were looking on and saw a great image. This great image and its brightness, excellent, was standing before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You were looking on until a stone was cut out without hands, and it smote the image on its feet of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. Then the iron and the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floor. And the wind took them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled all the earth. This is the dream, and its interpretation we declare before the sovereign. Now... Keep this in your mind, that this is a fixed interpretation from the Ruach of Yahuwah given to Daniel, which is going to reveal to you the exactness of the beast of the book of Revelation, the, the, the Chizayon of Yahukanan, the servant of Yahuwah. And it says here, you, O Sovereign, are a Sovereign of Sovereigns, for the Eloah of the heavens has given you a reign and power and strength and preciousness. Wherever the children of men dwell, or the beast of the field and the birds of the Shemayim, the heavens, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. And after you rises up, another rain lower than yours, and another third rain of bronze that rules over all the earth. And the fourth rain is as strong as iron, because iron crushes and shatters all. So like iron that breaks in pieces, it crushes and breaks all these. Yet as you saw the feet and toes Partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the rain is to be divided. But some of the strength of the iron is to be in it, because you saw the iron mixed with muddy clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of, partly of iron and partly of clay, so the rain is partly strong and partly brittle. And as you saw iron mixed with muddy clay, they are mixing themselves with the seed of men. But they are not clinging to each other even as iron does not mix with clay. And as the days of these sovereigns, the, uh, in the days of these sovereigns, the Eloah of the heavens shall set up a reign, a kingdom, Mahut, which shall never be destroyed. This is talking about the reign of the heavens, that what Yahushua had proclaimed in his life, the prophets had proclaimed through visions and dreams that they saw that the Mashiach would rule and that he would rule forever after these kingdoms. And it says, They shall set up a reign that shall never be destroyed. 
nor the rain pass on to other people. It crushes and puts to an end all these rains, and it shall stand forever. Because you saw the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great Eloah has made known to the sovereign what shall be after this. And the dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Then sovereign Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and did obeisance before Daniel and gave orders to present to him an offering and incense. The sovereign answered Daniel and said, Truly, your Eloah is the Eloah of Elohim, the master of sovereigns and a revealer of secrets since you were able to reveal this secret. Then the sovereign made Daniel great and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over all the provinces of Babel and the chief of the nobles over all the wise ones of Babel. And Daniel asked of the sovereign and he said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the work of the province of Babel. And Daniel in the gate of the sovereign. We see that this vision and the interpretation was true in such a way that Nebuchadnezzar made the one who gave the interpretation the ruler, the second in his reign, and that he would actually be within the gates of the king, ruler over all the provinces and all the wise men. And this Daniel did not practice soothsaying, he did not practice uh, wizardry and warlock. Uh, uh, these different things that the nations do. Uh, he didn't do any of these different things. What he did was he sought the face of the living Elohim that revealed secrets. And because Daniel walked in the way that pleased Yahuwah, and because the life of Daniel and his companions were valued in the eyes of Yahuwah, Yahuwah revealed the exactness and detail of the dream of Nebuchadnezzar and also gave to him the interpretation which thing Nebuchadnezzar himself did not understand. Now remember that scripture has fixed interpretation. The scriptures themselves say that scripture is not up for private interpretation. So these prophecies are all defined by scripture. And of course, Nebuchadnezzar, this pagan heathen king, was before a great image. And I'm sure he just wanted to worship this image because, of course, he knew the secret was that his face was the head. Because in the book of Daniel, we see clearly that Daniel says, You, O sovereign, are the head of gold. And when he saw this, he was amazed. He saw himself there. And and we know that after him would come an empire that would defeat his empire and that would conquer his empire that would be lesser than his and then there would be another that would be lesser than his and another that would be even lesser that at the end of their reign they would mix themselves with the seed of men and they would be partly iron and partly clay, partly strong and partly brittle. And that the rock, there is a rock that is cut out without hands, not an image now. We have an image, a pagan image. Now, if you remember in the scriptures, the scriptures teaches that Yahuwah, when we were to build an altar to Yahuwah in the Torah, unless it was done in a set-apart place, according to the, the, the uh, dimensions and according to the workings of the tabernacle, that when it was done in any other place, that it was done on a rock that nothing had uh, done any no graven work had been done there had been no cutting done on the stone okay there was no image made no likeness no graven work upon the stone it had to be a rock that was just a natural rock that was used a natural stone this represents Yahushua the natural stone the natural rock the one that is not concocted or conceived in the thoughts of mankind just like in Mount Sinai, when we see the giving of the ten words, the ten commands, the ten mitzvot, that the children of Yashorel did not see an image, but rather they were given a strict command not to make an image. We're not to make an image 
nor to bow down to them. This, these were the words of Yahuwah. And here we see that the rock that was cut out without hands, the rock which represents Yahuwah, the kingdom of Yahuwah, the image, the manifestation of Yahuwah, which is not according to the likeness and the thinkings of heathen kings or Gentiles or the workings of any mind of the people, but rather from the making of Yahuwah himself comes and it destroys this adulterous image. And that it comes in the time which there is another rain on the earth, a rain that is mixed partly strong iron, partly brittle clay. Okay, that it's going to come, that the Mashiach comes during this time. Okay, and destroys and smites this image. That is when he is going to set upon his throne. And that is when the thousand year reign shall begin and the commission and the beginning of Malchut Yahuwah upon this earth in fullness, which he will, after a thousand years, bring down the renewed Yahushalayim from the Shemayim, the heavens. And Yahuwah's tent will be with his people. Hallelujah. So let's go and take this in your mind and your heart, what we have seen here, that these nations are coming, there are nations that are coming, but the first nation is, has a default interpretation and it is fixed and it is true and it was from the word and from the word of Yahuwah himself, according to the prophet, that Nebuchadnezzar is the first of these, uh, these rulers that would come, that Babylon is the first nation, okay? Keep that in mind and we're going to go to Daniel. Chapter 7, Daniel chapter 7, and we'll begin in verse 3. And four great beasts came up from the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion, and had eagle's wings. I was looking until its wings were plucked off. And it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And it was given a man's heart. Okay, this first beast we're going to see clearly is a nation in a moment. This first beast is the first king. It is Nebuchadnezzar. It is Babylon. Now, if you look in archaeology... And modern day uh, Iraq and parts of uh, Iran and, and the regions that make up ancient Mesopotamia, which was Babel, you look at the archaeology from that region, you will see idols and graven works made of King Nebuchadnezzar, who was a mighty one, worshipped as a what people call a god, a, a Aloha, on the earth. And you will see one of his images is represented with his head specifically on the body of a lion with eagle's wings. You will also see this image, this likeness of a lion with eagle's wings is generally the mascot, the logo of the Babylonian culture. You will see it on the Ishtar gate, which is where the name Easter comes from. Ishtar being the female mighty one of Babylon, but you will see this in the, on the Ishtar gate, which today resides in, Ger uh, in Germany, in Berlin, in a museum. But you will see uh, this imagery all over the place in their workings. So this first image here, this first beast, correlates with the head of gold, which is Babylon, keep that in mind, and see another beast, a second, like a bear, and it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and they said, and they said this to it, arise, devour much flesh. Now this is the second empire, the empire that would overthrow Babylon, which is the Media Persian Empire, which Daniel himself lived to see, and he recorded the events of it, 
where uh, Babylon was overthrown by the Medes and the Persians, and this, the Medes and the Persians correlate on the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, it correlates with the chest and arms of silver. Okay, in verse 6 it says, After this I looked and saw another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and rule was given to it. And this beast is the Grecian Empire, which is defined in the book of Daniel in the next chapter, and we're going to examine it in just a moment. But we know that this imagery, as with the other beasts, that generally these beasts that are described are generally the mascots of the nations which are described. And we know that the leopard was used in the Grecian culture. But we also know, again, that there's a, it's going to be explained in a moment, but this Grecian beast that has the four heads, which the latter time revelation beast was like unto, remember the Greco-Roman beast that I talked about earlier, how they were like unto each other. It says it had uh, four wings like a bird, and the beast also had four heads, and rule was given to it, and the four heads are going to be four kings, but this represents the belly and the thighs of bronze, okay, on the great image which Nebuchadnezzar saw. So we have to lay scripture upon itself, and scripture interprets scripture, and there are default interpretations. Hallelujah! This proves that the scripture are indeed true. After this, I looked in the night visions, and saw a fourth beast, fearsome, and burly, exceedingly strong, and it had a great iron, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the rest with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was thinking about the horns, then saw another horn, a little horn coming up among them and three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots before it and see eyes like the eyes of a man were in this horn and a mouth speaking great words and I was looking until thrones were set up and the ancient of Yamim was seated his garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like clean wool his throne was flames of fire its wheels burning fire a stream of fire was flowing and coming forth from his presence and a thousand thousand served him and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him the judge was seated and the books were opened I was looking then because of the sound of the great words which the horn was speaking. I was looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning fire. And the rest of the beast had their rule taken away. But a lengthen of life was given to them for a season and a time. I was looking in the night visions and saw one like the son of Enosh, which means man, coming with the clouds of the heavens. And he came to the ancient of Yomim, or days, and they brought him near before him. This is talking about the Mashiach coming before Yahuwah, the Abba, hallelujah. And to him was given rulership and preciousness and a reign that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His rule is an everlasting rule which shall not pass away, and his reign that which shall not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit, my ruach was pierced within my body, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I drew near to one of those who stood by and asked him the certainty of all this. And he spoke to me and made known to me the interpretation of the matters. Again, the fixed interpretation is given. These great beasts, which are four, are four sovereigns, Four kings which rise up from the earth. We already know the first king was Nebuchadnezzar. 
We already know that he is indeed the head of gold. He is Babel. We know that the second beast, again, it is the chest. It is the arms of silver, media Persia. We know that the belly and the thighs of, the bron of bronze is Greece. The legs and the feet of that are iron and partly clay is Rome. And Rome mixed with the seed of men. And we're going to explain what that means. But we already know these things. And it says, Then the set of part ones of the Most High shall receive the rain and possess the rain forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. So after these great beasts, after these four, after they are destroyed with the rock without hands, who is the Mashiach, who is the Ben Anash, the son of Enosh, who came before the Ancient of Yamim, the Ancient of Days, who will receive the uh, reign and rulership forever, who is the king uh, that comes forth from the root of David, Dawid, the Beloved, who is the king priest, hallelujah, that surely must come prophesied by the Torah, prophesied by the prophets of old, the lion of the tribe of Yehuda. Hallelujah. And it says in verse 19, Then I desired for certainty concerning the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, very fearsome, from its teeth of iron, its nails of bronze, which devoured, crushed, and trampled down the rest with its feet. And concerning the ten horns which were on its head, and of the other horn which came up before which three fell, this horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke great words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was looking, and this horn was fighting against the set of part ones, and was prevailing against them until the ancient of Yamim came and right ruling was given to the set of part ones, the Kodashim of the Most High. And the time came and the set of part ones took possession of the rain. Hallelujah. This is what he said. The fourth beast is the fourth rain on earth, which is different from all other rains. It devours all the earth. It is a one world government. Remember this, a one world entity. It rules over, over every nation, tribe, and tongue. It says that it devours all the earth, tramples it down, and crushes it. And the ten horns on ten are ten sovereigns from this reign. They shall rise, and another shall rise after them. And it is different from all the first ones, and it humbles three sovereigns. And it speaks words against the Most High, and it wears out the set apart ones of the Most High. And pay close attention here. And it intends to change appointed times. Talking about Yahuwah's times now, his Shabbats, his, his feasts, his appointments, and his laws, his Torah, his instructions. And they are given into its hand for a time and times and a half of time. It is given to its hand when this beast receives such a power that it can change and think to change the times and the appointments and the Torah, the laws and instructions of Yahuwah and it receives rain for times and time and a half of time, which is exactly what the 1,260 days, the three and a half prophetic years of tribulation that the set-apart ones would be trampled down by this beast, according to the scriptures. But it also represents a lengthier time of 1,260 years, which we will get into in just a moment. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away its rule to cut off and to destroy until the end. And the reign and the rulership and the greatness of the reigns under all the heavens shall be given to the people, the set-apart ones of the Most High. 
His reign is an everlasting reign, and all rulership shall serve and obey Him. This is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me, and my color changed. And I kept the matter in my heart. This is a very amazing interpretation, and we know that this interpretation is indeed true, that this beast that would come forth, again the pattern being that the nations conquer each other, so that the, the great nation, Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, was indeed conquered by the uh, Media Persian Empire, which was indeed conquered by the Grecian Empire, which was consumed and conquered by the Roman Empire, and the great, this great uh, Roman Empire would be different from all the other empires, especially in the latter time of its reign, when it mixes itself with the seed of men, and that it would receive a, uh, a particular horn that would rise up in its head, a particular king that would speak uh, blasphemies against the Most High, who would even have the thoughts in his heart to change the appointments, the Sabbaths, the feasts, to change the Torah, the laws and the instructions of the Most High. And we are going to explain with clarity exactly what this little horn power is. This little horn power is anti-Messiah, of course, just about everyone who knows uh, anything about the prophecies in Scripture knows that one of the terms for the anti-Messiah who is expected to come, the last and final one, who is going to be destroyed by the Mashiach at His coming, that this one is called the Little Horn, that it is indeed the synonymous name for the anti-Messiah, the son of perdition. Hallelujah. We know that this is indeed the truth. And we go and take all this again, all this information that, that we've just read, and let's go now to the book of Daniel, chapter 8. And we're going to start with verse, let's see, we'll start with verse 3. And I lifted my eyes and looked and saw a ram standing beside the river, and it had two horns, and the two horns were high, and the one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. And I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, so that no beast, which is a nation, a kingdom, again, a default interpretation according to the, the previous chapter, chapter 7, that beasts are nations, so that no beast, no nation could stand before him. And there was no one to deliver from his hand, while he did as he pleased, and became great. And I was observing and saw a male goat come from the west over the surface of all the earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. Now this, this is symbolic of the anti-Messiah also, but this is talking about a different nation, and we're going to show you exactly who that nation is. But it has a conspicuous horn, just like there was a little horn that was conspicuous or different and diverse from the others in the Roman Empire. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him in the rage of his power. And I saw him come close to the ram, and he became embittered against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to withstand him. But he threw him down to the ground, and trampled on him. And there was no one to deliver the ram from his hand. And the male goat became very great, but when he was strong, the large horn was broken. And in place of it, four conspicuous ones came up toward the four winds of the heavens. Now, this is talking about the king. When this, this nation becomes strong, the horn, which is the king, it will be broken, and from it will come forth four rulers. 
on the same beast, a part of the same nation. Okay? And it says, And from, and four conspicuous ones came up toward the four winds of the heavens. And from one of them came a little horn. Again, a picture of the anti-Messiah. There comes a little horn, which became exceedingly great toward the south and toward the east and toward the splendid land, which is Yasharah. And it became great up to the host of the heavens, and it caused some of the hosts and some of the stars to fall to the earth and trample them down. It even exalted itself as high as the prince of the host. And it took that which is continual away from him and threw down the foundation of his set-apart place. This is telling you historically exactly who it is talking about. And because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose that which is continual. And it threw the truth down to the ground. And it acted and prospered. And I heard a certain set of part ones speaking, and another set of part ones said to that certain one who was speaking, Till when is the vision concerning that which is continual, talking about the continual offering, and the transgression that lays waste, which is the abomination of desolation, to make both the set apart place and the host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, For two thousand... 300 days, and that which is set apart shall be made right. And it came to be when I, Daniel, had seen the vision that I sought understanding and see before me stood one having the appearance of a mighty man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Ulai, who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. He then came near where I stood, and when he came, I feared, and I fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, son of man, for the vision is for the time of the end. And as he was speaking with me, I fell stunned upon my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up straight, and said, Look, I am making known to you what shall take place in the latter time of the wrath. For at the appointed time shall be the end. The ram which you saw, having two horns, are the sovereigns of Media and Persia. And the male goat is the sovereign of Greece. And the large horn between its eyes is the first sovereign. So all you have to know here. Again, this is history. You look up the Grecian Empire, and its first horn is Alexander the Great. I'm going to explain more about this in a moment, but all I'm saying is you can look this up. You can see this. And Alexander the Great overthrew the Media and the Persian Empire. Daniel prophesied concerning Alexander the Great before the Grecian Empire ever came to be, before Alexander the Great even came to be. That is why scholars try to say that Daniel must have been written by three or four different people, even though it specifically says that this was given to Daniel who saw this vision. Hallelujah. We know that this is an ancient revelation. Hallelujah. We have artifacts of the book of Daniel from more than 2,000 years ago. Hallelujah. And it reveals here clearly what I have been saying, that the, that the beast... That was that overthrew Babylon was the media Persian beast. Here, Daniel is receiving a revelation about the media Persian beast, and he sees that the pattern indeed is that the next beast that was to come, the Grecian beast, would overthrow the beast that overthrew Babylon, and that the same pattern would continue. So that whoever overthrew the Grecian beast by default, by locked interpretation has to be the fourth and final beast who is unlike all the beasts before it who tramples down and trods down 
and rules over the entire world and deceives all those whose names are not written in the book of life of the slain lamb who the Mashiach will come in the latter days in the latter times of its rule again it must be Rome it has to be Rome Rome still rules the world and I will show that and prove that in this series in this video hallelujah All right, then it says, And the male goat is the sovereign of Greece, and the large horn between its eyes is the first sovereign, and that it was broken and four stood up in its place are four rulerships arising out of that nation, but not in its power. And in the latter time of their rule, when the transgressors have filled up their measure, a sovereign, fierce of face and skilled at intrigues, shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, and not by his own power, and he shall destroy incredibly, and shall prosper and thrive, and destroy mighty men, and the set apart people. And through his skill, he shall make deceit prosper in his hand, and hold himself to be great in his heart, and destroy many who are at ease and even stand against the prince of princes yet without hand he shall be broken and what was said in the vision of the evenings and morning is truth and hide the vision for it is after many or me many days and I Daniel was stricken and became sick for Yamim for days and I rose up and went about the sovereign's work and I was amazed at the vision but there was no understanding. And we know that the book of Daniel is said to be a sealed book. That it was sealed at the time, but it was to be sealed and revealed in the latter time. And here we are, where this interpretation can be given concerning this beast, concerning what was to transpire in the latter times. Again, we know the head of gold was Babylon. We know that the chest of arms is a, a, of silver is the media Persian beast. We know that the belly of thighs, I mean the belly and thighs that they is of bronze is the Grecian beast. We know that the legs and the feet of iron that and partly clay is Rome. And we know how this now correlates with these beasts that were seen in Daniel chapter 7, the beasts which were the lion that correlated with Babylon, the bear which correlated with Media Persia. And then after the bear we had the leopard with four heads which represents the four horns in Daniel chapter 8 which we just read. And this being the Grecian Empire, according to Daniel 8, explicitly said here that it would in fact be Greece. And then we know that the last beast, the one that is different from all the beasts that has seven heads and ten horns, would be the Roman beast. So we have this broken down now. And now clarity can be given concerning the book of Daniel in chapter 8. The first horn again that rose up from the Grecian beast was King Alexander. And you read where in the latter times of this, this beast, this Grecian beast, that this King Alexander, the horn, the little horn, the conspicuous horn, would be broken and four would arise. And these were the four generals which rose to power after King Alexander, but they did not arise in his same power. They did not rise as sovereigns. They rose as a four as, as four generals that ruled over the provinces of Greece. They were Cassander who ruled over Greece and its region. Lysimachus, which ruled over Asia Minor, which is composed mostly of present-day Turkey. Seleucus, which ruled over Mesopotamia, which comprised Assyria, and Yashirah. And we know that Ptolemy, 
and the Ptolem and his dynasty ruled over Egypt during the time of Cleopatra. And during and, and, and so so there's a lot of history here, okay? A lot of history that you can readily access. Alright, the little horn which grew exceedingly great, again, this was fulfilled through these four men. The dominion of this horn, the particular one that rose up from one of the four horns, this one that would be a man of dark, uh, of dark understandings who, who works and practices deceit, he would, be one, he would be a man that would come through one of the four dynasties of these generals, and this man would be Antiochus, Epiphanes, who ruled over Syria and Yasharel under the Seleucid, uh, Seleucid dynasty. Okay? Yasharel's land was fought over between the dynasties of Seleucid and Ptolemy, but the Seleucids gained power over the region in the days of Antiochus III. And Antiochus IV, if you just do some history, just a history study about him, you'll just learn that he gained the throne by murdering his own brother. So we know that deceit and, and treachery uh, would indeed prosper through this man. Uh, the former, uh, which, uh, the for, his brother was the former king, uh, Seleucus Philopater. The son of Philopater was the rightful heir to the throne. But Antiochus IV had him held hostage in Rome. And Antiochus IV legitimized his rule mainly through flatteries and briberies and through building of uh, stadiums and through building of mystery schools and through gaining the hearts of the people through religious efforts in which he himself obtained names such as uh, epiphanies, which meant the manifest light or the manifest... Uh, 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 understanding or illustrious, it can also mean, and it correlates directly with being a mighty one or a deity, what is what they call it uh, in the Greco-Roman uh, beast system. Uh, but anyway, so he earned these types of titles. He also earned the titles Theo, uh, and he was called Theo Epiphanes, and the word Theo is what they used in the Greek versions of the New Testament, the later forms, which in the earlier forms they used this, this uh, they used abbreviations to show that Yahuwah's name should be there, but uh, in the later forms, and the Texas Receptus and such, you see terms like Theo, which completely cover up Yahuwah's name, which Theo, again, is a pagan term and title for pagan kings and pagan mighty ones. And such a pagan one as Antiochus the fourth, which uh, was the anti-Messiah of his day, we, and we're going to do, we're going to talk about him a little bit further. He's mentioned explicitly in the Book of Maccabees for setting up the abomination of desolation, which was the image of Zeus, which we're going to talk about a little later. But and and also for many horrible murders and disgusting and just just horrible things. I really recommend reading. First and Second Maccabees, uh, and, and getting a, a groundwork in the in what took place at this time, this historic time when Antiochus uh, Epiphanes would come to power. He was called Epimenes or Madman by uh, many of, of the people within his own reign, with his within his own kingdom. Okay, so we just broke down this basically this chapter and gave you uh, some history. To show you this beast, this beast system, has this has transpired. That the Grecian beast, the Roman beast, all these things, now we're in the time of the end, we're in the latter time. And when you saw that the beast, the latter beast, this latter beast has seven heads, I'm going to explain how that works. Again, remember that this is a conglomerate beast that in the book of Revelation chapter 13, you saw that this beast was made up of, it was likened to a leopard, Right? It had feet like unto a bear, which was the media Persian Empire. It was like unto the Grecian Empire. And that it had a mouth like the Babylonian Empire, which was the lion. So it was a conglomerate beast, right? And it had seven heads. 
if you count all the heads of the beast in, chap in Daniel chapter 7, which make up the, the same beast, the latter time beast of, of Revelation chapter 13 that we just read about, you have exactly seven heads. And we know that these seven uh, empires were ruled over Rome, uh, over by Rome. So the seven heads of the Roman beast are Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, Assyria, Asia Minor, Egypt, and Rome. And how we know this, again, is because the Grecian beast ruled over four, it had four heads, four horns, and it ruled over uh, Greece, of course, in its region, Asia Minor, and it ruled over Mesopotamia and Egypt. So these these four, which Greece is a part of, the three extra, are added into the overall numberings. So what we have here again is Babylon, which was a province of Rome, a, a head of Rome, Media Persia, Greece, Assyria, Asia Minor, Egypt, and Rome. These are the seven heads of the Roman beast system which are participating at large in these latter days in the forming of a new world order. And you see the civil unrest, especially in the lands and the regions that I just mentioned. Modern day Babylon being Iraq, uh, Media Persia making up Iran, uh, Greece, which is still Greece, Assyria, which is Syria, Asia Minor, which makes up, and we're gonna, well, we're gonna break that down in just a moment, but it makes up the all these different uh, nations that make up the European Union today, Egypt, and Rome. We see all this strife and all these different things, and all the civil unrest, and all these uh, various things that are taking place with these nations today. Which again, this is a fixed interpretation. This is a, one of those things that are defined within the scriptures. And if we take this at face value, then again we have defined the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in chapter 2, where he saw again the head of gold was himself, Babylon, the, the chest and arms, the silver, Media Persia, the belly and the thighs, the bronzes, Greece, the legs and the feet are iron and partly clay, they're divided, there's a division, they are the legs, there's two of them. And indeed, this, this correlates with Rome, as I have been saying. But now let's get into the history so that we can reveal not only the seven heads, but the ten horns. We're the ten kings, the ten crowns that sit on the horns, where, this, where, all, where we should look for all this to rise up uh, in this time that we now live in. The western leg of the Roman Empire... Uh, again, if you if you you have to know some history, if you know some history, there was a split between Rome, in which created the Dark Ages of Rome, uh, and ultimately what seemed to be the fall of Rome, which not really there didn't really ever uh, there was really never a fall, and we're going to go in, we're going to kind of explain that the beast definitely his wound has definitely been healed, and he rules over the world, and the whole world's marveled over him. But, uh, and, and they do in this latter time. But, uh, anyway, this, these, Rome divided in two. The western part of Rome fragmented into numerous regions. It's populated by various people. Over time, the Germanic tribes in the western leg, the western side of Rome, set up new kingdoms, such as the Visigoths, in Spain, the Franks and Gaul, which eventually became France and Germany, the Angles and Saxons in Britain, and the Lombards in Italy, and through all these changes over all these different all, all these all these centuries, the Western Roman Empire has evolved into most of today's 
European Union, which is a conglomeration, a, unite, a, a uniting of these different beasts, these diverse beasts, which it is showing us is diverse from all the other beasts, in which it incorporates all of Rome. It has been called the revived Roman Empire, the European Union. Okay? So, uh, the overwhelming dominant power of today's Western leg of the old Roman Empire lies within five particular nations which should be considered to be five toes on one foot of Nebuchadnezzar's image. And even if you don't particularly agree with what I have to say here concerning these nations, you, I'm going to provide the maps and you can look at these things and see them for yourselves that these modern nations Indeed, on the western side make up today Britain, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. Again, major players and partners in the revival of the Roman Empire, the European Union. In 293 of the Common Era, the Roman Empire Diocletian shifted the center of the Roman Empire eastward toward Byzantium. The eastern leg of the empire became known as the Byzantine Empire or the Eastern Roman Empire. In 326 Constantine renamed Byzantinium as Constantinopolis. Today, this is Istanbul, Turkey. So you can start to see how you know all this is starting to come together. But when the Roman Emperor Diocletian shifted the center of the Roman Empire eastward, again there he created this division, which are the two legs, and the eastern uh, the eastern part of Rome would then flourish and go through a time. Uh, of, of, of science and understanding, all these different things, according, and they're, according to, to, to them at least, you know, what they consider flourishing. But now the western leg, however, would go through what was known as the Dark Ages. And during the Dark Ages, these people nearly would, I mean, uh, literally would go to the Colosseums starving to death. And when there were uh, public uh, killings and things like that, because the people were starving to death, but yet they still had to go to the Colosseum, still had to go support their favorite teams, their favorite chariots, still had to, you know, to, to live beyond their means, like certain Roman cultures that we know of today, even in their poverty. Because they were starving to death when there would be the public killings, they were even eating the corpses of the people who were killed in the Colosseums, so they went through cannibalization, all these other things. So people talk about how civilized the Romans were. Yeah, you know, these civilized Romans, when uh, food was taken from them and their their stomachs began to turn, they were forced to cannibalization. They went through the dark ages, some of the darkest times of uh, of of recent history. So. Just to give you some, some understanding of what's going on. Over centuries, Byzantine, the Byzantine Empire, also went underwent many changes, just like the Western leg went through many changes. Finally, in 1453, the Osmanli, a nomadic tribe in Turkey, Islamic tribe, conquered the Byzantine capital, capital Constantinople. Thus began the Ottoman Empire, named after the first ruler, Osman. The Great Ottoman Empire essentially was a continuance of the Byzantine or Eastern leg of the Roman Empire, and it lasted for almost six centuries until 1923. And here we have it. Here we're beginning to see the mixture in the latter times that took place with the Roman beast, which was iron, mixing with the Islamic Ottoman Empire, which is represented by the miry clay, the, the muddy clay. And people say, well, 
uh, do you have that reverse? Because isn't the the Roman Empire uh, more uh, more muddy clay? Isn't you know? And the Islamic Empire doesn't that seem more like it's iron in these last days? You know, all these things. No, it actually doesn't. Because see, what happened with the religion of Islam? which is, uh, is, is not according to the Torah and the Prophets and the Scriptures of Yahuwah, but when the, this Islamic Empire came to be, uh, their leaders do not call themselves mighty ones. Now they set themselves up and are, are treated like you know, royalty and princes and they're treated like mighty ones on the earth, but they don't walk around with names such as Theos. In other words, like Theos, which Antiochus Epiphanes was called, Theos Epiphanes, the mighty one, the, the, the G-O-D, the God, or whatever, manifest, or, you know, the equivalent of trying to say the Elohim, the mighty one, manifest. The Islamic nations, they don't call themselves the Allah manifest. I mean, at least none of them have yet. I mean, I, I, I haven't heard of anything like that. So, because they don't do that, they don't have that same, uh, that same power within within their nation, the same power that, that, that does this, that, that, that does this uh, trampling and destroying, that destroying power, and I'm going to prove that because that spirit is ultimately anti-Messiah, but we know anti-Messiah is also the spirit of anyone who denies the Father and the Son, the Abba and the Ben, which the Islamic religion does, which the, again, the land of Turkey today is an Islamic nation that has mixed itself into the uh, nation of Rome via the Ottoman Empire, okay? And again, we have this correlation with all these nations and their strong ties and relationship to the modern revival of Rome, the European Union. Okay, so, now, with the decline of the Ottoman Empire in 1923, Amazingly, four dominant states arose. I mean, this is absolutely amazing how this, how Scripture uh, gave this amazing detail how this would take place. The four dominant states that arose were Greece, Turkey, Syria, and Egypt, which make up the four uh, heads of Daniel's third beast, the Grecian Empire. We see that Turkey again is the uh, is 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 linked up with Asia Minor, the ancient Asia Minor, which was it became a, an Islamic nation, which is the mixing and the mingling again. And then now we have Syria and Egypt, and all they are all Islamic nations, which are mixed and mingled also within this beast that is mixed and mingled in with Greece, which became mixed and mingled into this conglomerate beast in the latter times. But in this last time, after the Ottoman Empire took control, these beasts became powers again. It's amazing how these things take place. The dominant power of today's eastern leg of the old Roman Empire lies with the following nations that could that should be considered the five na the five toes of the eastern leg of Rome, which are Egypt, which was ancient Mitzrayim, which the, the children of Yashorel were in captivity. Greece, which again, the Grecians have uh, held the children of Yashorel in captivity. Uh, Iran and Iraq, which was ancient Babylon, which these nations, ancient Babylon, held the children of Yashorel in captivity. Syria, and we know Syria's involvement with keeping the children of Yashorel in captivity. Turkey. And again, we know the involvement of all these nations, Asia Minor, 
and their persecution and all these different things, that, are, that, that the conflicts that rose throughout history with the children of Yisrael and all these things with all these nations. And here we see that these nations which existed then in some way, shape, and form today exist in some way, shape, and form and that they all come together and amazingly represent ten toes again a revival and united and a European union and they are all connected or correlated again in some way some fashion into this B system alright so today the expanse of the seven heads which have ten horns, the seven heads again being Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, Assyria, Asia Minor, Egypt, and Rome. The ten horns that come forth from these seven are Britain, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Egypt, Greece, Iran and Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. Now, Assyrian, the word Assyrian, which is what uh, Antiochus Epiphanes was called, in Abrit is Asher, okay? And Asher is the word for ten also in Abrit. So when it says that these nations were, were split up into ten, that there were ten toes, it meant that there is Asher. And Asher is the name of of one of the tribes of Yasharel, but it's also name, the, one of the names of the mighty one of the Assyrians, Asher, who holds the bow and arrow, who is their son, pagan sun deity. But we know what this means. This is saying that this, this, uh, this, these uh, legs of iron in the latter times, when they mixed and mingled, it's telling you, when it tells you ten, it's telling you basically who they mixed and mingled with, and they mix and mingle with the people of Assyria. Again, this is talking about the mixing and mingling with the, the people of Rome, the Roman people, and the people of the Assyrians, the people of uh, uh, a lot of the Islamic empires that we see today. Okay, So we see this correlation together, and that this indeed makes up the first beast. But this is the other face of European Islam. This is footage of the demonstration outside the Danish Embassy in London, provided to CBN News by the NIFA Foundation, an anti-terrorism group. What you can't see in this video is that one of the demonstrators is dressed as a suicide bomber. Even moderate British Muslims were outraged that no one was arrested, even though British law forbids incitement to murder. But it follows a pattern of extraordinary and some would say dangerous tolerance of Muslim radicals. These protests threatening bloodshed occurred in 2004, one year before London's 7-7 subway and bus bombings. Now Tony Blair has been warned. Pull your troops out of Afghanistan. Pull your troops out of Iraq. And if you do not pull your troops out, you will get bloodshed on the streets Polls of London. do suggest the Muslim middle is radicalizing. A recent survey shows that 40% of British Muslims want Islamic Sharia law in the United Kingdom. Sharia imposes punishments like amputations and stonings. And in a separate poll, nearly one-third of Muslims agreed with the statement that Western society is decadent and immoral and that Muslims should seek to bring it to an end. Critics say that European political correctness and multiculturalism, which were supposed to embrace Muslim radicals and somehow westernize them, have seriously backfired. And now Western Europe seems paralyzed by the political correctness that grips the government and the media. I said that the Assyrian uh, in Scripture is, when you see any time in Scripture where you read about the Assyrian, and people say, well, this is talking about Anthem Messiah, and they give you the various Scriptures. This is talking about the little horn, that conspicuous horn that came forth from the four horns in Daniel chapter 8 who comes forth from one of the heads of the leopard. In other words, he comes forth from one of the dynasties, the generals that ruled over Greece. 
again, being Antiochus Epiphanes, he ruled over Assyria. He was the Assyrian. He was the king of Assyria. All right? All right, now, to get back into the history of Rome a little bit, and we've got to talk about this power that Rome has, and so we've got to build into how it got this power, where it gets this power from. So we're going to talk about the Emperor Constantine. Emperor Constantine is called the Pontifus Maximus, considered the first pope. Now, the, the Catholic Church, which means the universal church, will claim that the first pope was St. Peter, which is not at all you know, clear on which Saint Simon Peter they're talking about, because it seems to be that they're talking about Simon Magus, though the, uh, the magician in the Book of Acts, who tried to buy the gift of the Ruach HaKodesh because he thought it could be bought, because he thought it was some type of magic or wizardry. Okay, So that is probably who they're actually talking about as being their first pope, the word pope meaning papa or daddy, which Yahushua explicitly says, call no man father, don't call them rabbi, rabbi meaning chief one, my chief one. <clears throat> don't call them that, but that we, we, we are supposed to be brothers and sisters. But anyway, uh, Constantine considered the first pope. He ruled from 306 to 337. He initially inherited possessions of Britain, of Gaul, and Spain. And after a series of victories over Maxinius, he uh, became master of Italy in the year 312. He now ruled over the Western Empire as Licinius ruled over the Eastern Empire. But war broke out between them in 314 of the Common Era. And in 323, after the battle of Chalcedon, Chalcedon, in which Licinius was killed, Constantine became sole ruler of the whole Roman Empire. Now, Constantine had a dilemma because his empire had many people who had gone after the Mashiach. Now many of them at this, this present time, uh, during his time, had already fallen away. There was a great falling away. Scripture says during the time of Paul, who is his true name being Shaul, uh, that there was a great falling away even then. Okay? But we knew that there was, there was another falling away that is to come. But we know that there was all this... this this paganism that had already crept into uh, the the belief systems of some of the people, but there were people who called on you who would profess Yahushua and kept the Shabbat during this time. Okay, and they were known as the Nazarene or the Nazarenes. Okay, not, I'm not talking about the Church of the Nazarene. I'm not talking about any, any crazy cult organization. I'm talking about the true people of the way who guarded the way. This is the the, the sect that um, Shaul was a part of, the Nazarene, who walked in the way, according to the book of Acts. Okay, but during this time, Constantine had a dilemma because a lot of his, uh, of his subjects and the people in his empire were, uh, in some way, shape, or form, converted to the belief system of the people of the way. And at this time, they were using terms like Christian, and we know that they were the believers in the way were first called Christians in Antioch, and they were called Christians by Grecian people. The term Christian coming from Christos, which comes from Crete, and uh, Christianus, which is which which also comes from the people of Crete, uh, and all these different things. And it was used frequently for mighty ones and various things, so it wasn't anything special or spectacular. Mashiach or Messiah, however refers to the anointed of Yahuwah, okay? But however, anyway, these people, had, and some of them called, began to call Christians and all these different things, but they weren't using names like Jesus at this time at all. This name didn't exist. And history tells us that during this time they were explicitly using the original names. But, um, so, you know, Constantine had to figure out a way to get these people to leave their their faith 
because these people would, would die in the Colosseums for their faith, for their beliefs. They would die by the thousands and did. So he had to figure out a way to get into their heads and to use some psychology to unite his kingdom. And that's ultimately what he did. He, he claimed to have converted to Christianity in which he saw a vision of the chi ro symbol. The chi ro symbol being an ancient uh, symbol used amongst different cultures, such as uh, the Grecian and the Roman culture, used for sexuality. It is used by the Pope system, the, this little horn system, to this very day, the chi ro symbol. And when Constantine saw this Chiro symbol, this was again his conversion experience, he heard a voice that told him to go and conquer in this symbol, in this image, in this likeness. Okay? So he sees this pagan image that he was already using, they were already using, okay? And he said, go, he, hear, he heard the voice say, go and conquer in this symbol, and he got the revelation to supposedly convert into Christianity, which he didn't even get immersed, well, he didn't even get immersed at all, but he, under, basically what happened was now Constantine, that he, be, he decided to become a Christian, under the, the, the decree of this, this emperor, the entire state of Rome was, uh, was turned into a Christian state without one single immersion Without one single person calling on the name of Yahuwah, which again, we, we, we talked about earlier, that this was one of the first steps of being saved, of receiving salvation, is calling upon the Shem. Not one person called on the name. Not one person was immersed. They didn't call on any name. They didn't even get immersed in any name. Not nationwide or anything. They didn't even get immersed in a blasphemous name. They didn't do anything. It was just signed on paper. That all now, all of a sudden, this is our religion. So now... He could use that reverse psychology to get into the minds and begin to win the hearts of a lot of the secularized uh, Gentile converts who had already began to practice and mix and mingle their own pagan beliefs with the true revelation of Yahushua. And it was very easy to sway them, uh, especially when uh, he created the council of Nicaea to make an Easter observance universal in which there was much protest from the original followers of the way who were the Nazarenes that they would not observe Easter because it was blasphemous and it was pagan and they also had the council of Nicaea to set the standard of worship on the venerable day of the sun, which are the words of Emperor Constantine. He didn't say on the Sabbath day. Matter of fact, later on in the Council of Laodicea, it says that Christians must not Judaize by keeping the Sabbath, but must keep the day of the sun as the Lord's day, or Baal's day, which is what Lord means in Hebrew, or be cut off. During this time, people who called on the, on the name of Yahuwah, people who called on the name of Yahushua, people who kept the Sabbath, if you kept the Sabbath at all, if you did any of the commandments at all, you would be killed, you would be slaughtered, they would burn you at the stake, they would call you a Judaizer. Nowhere in Scripture do you see the term, the Jewish Sabbath, but rather you hear Yahushua say that the Sabbath, the Shabbat, was made for man. Hallelujah. The book of Hebrews says that there remains a Sabbatismo, is what it says in the Greek. A Sabbath keeping is what that literally means. A Sabbath keeping remains for the people of Elohim. So, all of a sudden you can start to see how this Constantine rises up and creates the beginning of the works and the foundations of a different movement in Rome. A mixture of Babel, a migdal of Babel, a, a stronghold of Babel, a confusion, a mixture. Where he's starting to uh, force 
by the sword, the keeping of the venerable day of the sun, which again, if you do some history, do some digging uh, on, on this uh, Emperor Constantine, who's the first Pope of the Roman Catholic Church, the Universal Church, you will see that before his supposed conversion experience, where he saw this Chiro sex symbol in the, sky, in the sky and heard from the son a voice that said, go and conquer in this, this pagan symbol and go kill my people, supposedly, I guess is what we're supposed to believe. That Yahuwah the Most, Most High, he completely changed everything. You know, now he's showing images, uh, pagan images. Before on Mount Sinai, he showed no image. Now all of a sudden, to pagan kings, he's showing pagan sex images. And tell them to go kill, go kill my people uh, who keep the Shabbat. Who call on my name. Go kill them. No. Who can believe this nonsense, this garbage that the Roman Catholic Church is built on? Who has shed more blood than any organized religion or state known to man? Anyway, so this all took place. But it was in the year 538 that the so-called Pope, the little horn power, that had been created by Constantine and his conversion experience, again, uh, to emphasize Constantine when he converted, I mean, some years later, he had his own son and family members and friends killed after his conversion experience. So this tells you what kind of man this man really was. In the history of the Christian church, volume 3, it reads, The Roman church state power became supreme in Christendom in 538 of the common era. Due to a letter of the Roman Emperor Justinian, known as Justinian's Decree, which set up and acknowledged the Bishop of Rome as the head of all churches. The head of all churches. And it is the head of all of these fake churches. The word church being a Roman Latin word which mean and it comes from seriously where we get circle and also the word circus it doesn't it doesn't refer to assembly the way that that the word ecclesia in the Greek even does but specifically the word kahal in Hebrew abrit meaning an assembly of people and of course they have power over all that the bishop of Rome the Pope, we're going to show this in a minute, how all the world marvels and wonders after this beast. The Bishop of Rome as, as the head of all the churches. It gave the Roman church state political power, civil power, as, as well as ecclesiastical power, which means you know, the power of assembly. So it has civil power, political power, and ecclesiastical power. This letter became part of Justinian's Code, the fundamental law of the empire. And that year, Pope Vigilus ascended the throne under the military protection of Belisarius, one of Justinian's generals. Now, I find it very interesting that this happened when it happened in 538. And I'm going to tell you why in just a moment. But just keep that, that number locked away into your mind, to your heart, and what happened and how they how this, this position, this little horn, this different power, this different king power came to be, and how it has you know power unlike any of the other beasts that this beast has civil political power which is also ecclesiastical in the sense that it rules over the people of the most high it has infiltrated now supposedly in its mind and it's right the people of the most high now it can give a divine dictate into all the world where it is the supreme and head of all the assemblies or the so-called churches. This beast that thinks to change times and laws, again that little horn, remember that little horn in the book of Daniel chapter 7, it had a mouth speaking blasphemous things, it had the desire to change the appointed times of the Most High, the Sabbath, the Shabbat, had the desire to change the, uh, the decrees of Yahuwah and his Torah, his instructions, which means that they would mess around with the word of Yahuwah themselves. Hmm. 
What does it say here? In the Catholic Mirror. Let's read this. The Catholic Mirror, September 23rd, 1983. Cardinal Gibbon states, The Catholic Church, by virtue of her divine mission, changed the day from Saturday, which is, is the Roman you know, name for the seventh day of the week, from what they call Saturday to what they call Sunday. Right? So the Catholic Mirror specifically says that by her divine mission they changed the Sabbath to Sunday. The, cat, the, the convert's catechism of Catholic doctrine on page 50 is in the third edition. It says in question 51, which is the Sabbath day? In answer 51, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question 51. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer 51. We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea in the common era of 336 transferred the sovereignty from Saturday to Sunday. The Catholic Church has never said that Sunday is the Sabbath. It claims that it is that Sunday is the venerable day of the sun, that it is the sun's day. It says here in the Catholic Record of London, Ontario, September the first, nineteen twenty-three, Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the scriptures of the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. The Catholic Church, again, it boasts that Sunday, the keeping of the venerable day of Mithra, the sun god. Remember the people in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel how they had their backs toward the temple and they were worshiping the sun, the women weeping for Tammuz, that image of jealousy which was the obelisk, which was a, 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 a pillar for the sun, mighty one. All that sun worship, and now they got you keeping Sunday, they got you keeping Easter because of the Council of Nicaea, and yet, when you tell people and you show them in history, they still won't believe you. They still refuse to believe you because they're drunk with the wine of the whoring of the beast and of its system and of the whore that rides the beast. Surely, this is the little horn which has thought to change times and seasons. And if you look in the in, in encyclopedia, when you look up the Gregorian calendar, you will see that the Gregorian calendar is the universal calendar that is used today. It is the universal calendar for economy and for uh, business and all these different things. All, almost all nations of the world will default to the Gregorian calendar uh, as a universal calendar means and it tells you that it is a universal accepted civil calendar right inside the encyclopedia. This uh, calendar when you look it up when it was specifically created by Pope Gregory the so-called Pope P-O-P-E I'm just going to spell it from here on out the P-O-P-E because I don't even want to give him the dignity. He created this calendar to fix a date for Easter okay so that, so that the people could celebrate this ancient sexual rite and, the, and to creep it into the working of the church which they had begun to force on the people in the time of Constantine and the, in the Nicene Creed. And they, you, you look at this, this, uh, this calendar and you know if you just research calendars in, in the ancient world that all calendars were directly related to the religious system of the people. It represented who you worshipped. 
It was a sign and a mark upon you because it dictated what times you kept. Do you keep the times of Yahuwah? Do you keep his Shabbat? Do you keep his feast? Or do you keep the feast of Baal? Do you keep the feast of Satan, such as the Mass of Christ, the Saturnalia, the Yule time, the Ishtar? Do you do any of the, sun, the Sunday worship, the venerable day of the sun, one of the marks of the beast that they specifically tell you right there in the Catholic record? What do you keep? What do you observe? Let's go to the book of Exodus, chapter 31, and we're going to read in the book of Exodus, Shemoth 31, in verse 12, and we're going to read through verse 17. And it says, And Yahuwah spoke to Moshe, who has been called Moses, saying, And you shall speak to the children of Yasharal, saying, My Shabbat." You are to guard by all means, for it is a sign, the same word that was used for the oath that the Shema, remember the greatest command is an oath, that Yahuwah's commandments, His laws, and all these things are an oath in our forehead as a sign between Him and us. And it says here that my Sabbath, you are to guard by all means, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, to know that I, Yahuwah, am setting you apart, and you shall guard the, the Shabbat, for it is set apart to you. Everyone who profanes it shall certainly be put to death, for anyone who does work on it, that being, shall be cut off from among his people. Six Yomim, work is done. And on the seventh is a Shabbat, a Sabbath of rest, set apart. To Yahuwah, everyone doing work on the Sabbath shall certainly be put to death. And the children of Yashorel shall guard the Shabbat, the Sabbath, to observe the Shabbat throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. Now if you believe you have everlasting life through Yahushua, then you have to believe that this is true when it says it's an everlasting covenant because it's the same word in the Greek, the word everlasting is olam and it means a perpetual covenant is an ongoing covenant a covenant of everlasting hallelujah it is an everlasting covenant between me and the children of Yashrael it is a sign forever for in six yomim Yahuwah made the Shammai in the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh yom, he rested and was refreshed. And when he had ended speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moshe two ta ta tablets of the witness, tablets of stone written with the finger of Elohim, which of course, Yahuwah, who wrote this these commandments, with his own finger, wrote in commandment 4 that we guard the Shabbat. Okay? Again, the Torah is to be written on the heart, so we are supposed to be guarding his Sabbath by all means. They are a perpetual sign, a perpetual covenant. And the Roman beast, again, was prophesied to have a little horn, a power that would get into the business of the Most High. Not that this power hadn't. Uh, been doing this beforehand. There had been anti-Messiahs before, but never had they mixed and mingled themselves into the Word of the Most High. We know that the Catholic Church, it, when they came to power, they had the Scriptures translated into the Roman tongue, the Latin tongue, and that they wouldn't allow people to even own your own Scriptures, and if you owned your own Scriptures, they would kill you, burn you. Do all types of things to you. People forget this stuff. They forget of all the different things that happened in the persecutions and all these different things of the time of old. But of course, yes, they've done this. And now they say they have the dictates to, to dictate the word of Yahuwah. Not just the word of their own pagan mighty ones like they had been doing. But now they've mixed it and got themselves into a position of power to just about everyone who picks up a scripture or any type of Bible in some, in some way, shape, or form, they will acknowledge this Roman beast without even knowing it because they will, they will uh, take in their doctrine through these translations and through these different, different things and through these different traditions of men such as Sunday worship. They will give the beast 
esteem, bowing down to the power of the Vatican, admitting that they are in, tr in fact the head of their assembly instead of the Messiah, Yahushua, being the head of the assembly. And we know, again, the word anti-Messiah means the instead of Messiah, one who is in the place of. All right. Now I want you to remember that, that this Roman beast with the seven heads and the ten horns receives a deadly wound. Remember I told you to tuck away in your mind the year 538 when the, the papal government received its own power, becoming political and having civil power and ecclesiastical power. Um, and then when we go and we fast forward into history, we see that this B system that rose up received a deadly wound by Napoleon in a, in a so-called effort on his part to free the Roman Empire. He had the so-called Pope, the P-O-P-E, dethroned, and its power removed. We can read about this pretty, uh, pretty much in detail in Richard Dupa's book, and a brief account of the subversion of the papal government. He writes that in 1798, Pius the sixth was dethroned on his anniversary in the Sistine Chapel. He also writes that the P.O.P.E.'s insignia, which was the Chi Rho and the phallic keys of Jupiter, uh, was removed everywhere, and that he himself was taken prisoner in a town home called Hell. Okay? It was interesting that he was taken into France by Napoleon, and just like we read in the book of Revelation, chapter 13 earlier, that he who led into captivity was carried into captivity, and he was cut off, and there was no more power left in him for a season. So if you take the year 1798, when this took place, Napoleon put an end to the uh, head of the Vatican and of their rulership and took them into captivity, just as the scripture says that he leaves in captivity, he must be taken into captivity. This is the patience and endurance of the set apart ones. If you... If you take away, if you take 1798 and subtract uh, the year 538, which was when the papal government came to power, you are left with exactly 1,260 years. Now, this is no coincidence because, again, the scripture said that he must reign for times time and a half a time which equates a time is one year times being two years the dividing of times being a half a year the ancient historical year of all just about all uh, ancient civilizations was a default 360 days so 360 days times three years you get 1080 days total times then you have a, a half a time or half of a year would be 180 days. If you add that together, you have 1,260 days. Again, that is Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, where it specifically says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. And we see that this, this power that they had, this absolute power, lasted exactly 1,260 uh, years to the day. In Daniel 12, verse 7, it says, And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, and he held up his right hand and his left hand unto the Shemaim, the heavens, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it may be for a time, times, and a half, 
And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the Kadosh people, the set apart people, of all these, all these things shall be finished. Revelation chapter 11 verse 2 says, But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, the Goyim, the nations, and the Kadosh city, shall they tread under foot for forty and two months, which equals the one thousand two hundred and sixty days. Hallelujah. So we know that this is explicitly fulfilled through the Vatican power. And remember that the Vatican power, this head that receives a deadly wound, it must be healed. And it was healed when it was reinstated by Mussolini in 1929. Newspapers in various places around the world claim that the Vatican's wound was healed. So we see that this little horn, power, again, this position, is the so-called papacy. They are the modern emperors of Rome. They hold that power today, the legacy of being a Roman Kaiser, a Roman emperor, a pontifus maximus over the people. And they have a great, huge following in Catholicism, nearly two billion people of the world, some way, shape, or form, are connected to the Vatican in conjunction with all the Protestant denominations of the world, which they claim they are the head of, according to Justinius's decree. Now, if these ten heads that I proposed in the European Union are not enough to convince you of the power that has taken place, that there are ten provinces which could sprout forth ten kings to fulfill this latter time beast, which are the ten toes of the image which Nebuchadnezzar saw, which startled him because it was destroyed by the Messiah. So in other words, the Messiah comes during this time. If that was not enough, the European Union, who makes up this beast, has now on their website europa.eu and you can and you can read various documents where they show maps of the world where the whole world is divided into 10 unions constructed after their likeness in which other nations unify give up their sovereign power to become one conglomerate beast in other words, they are making beasts and nations in their own image. We're going to explain what I'm talking about in just a moment. But just keep all this in mind. That wasn't enough. So we see that there is a plan by the Roman powers that be to indeed trample and subdue every tribe and nation and tongue by dividing them into ten powers in the latter days, which could also represent the ten toes again, which it says specifically that it is mixed with iron and partly clay, the clay being that they mixed and mingled themselves with the seed of men. And we see that this beast has the potential to be a globalized seed, and it will be a globalized situation in which all peoples, tribes, and tongues shall participate and be incorporated into the ten horns, the ten toes, which sprouts forth from this European beast that desires to make all these beasts in its likeness and after its model. This proposition of dividing the world into ten regions is not uh, an isolated incident with just the European Union. It has been, pro it has been uh, presented by the United Nations, which again is right over there in Europe, connected directly with the European Union very heavily. But this has also been proposed by the Club of Rome. We know that the European Union the meeting place of the European Union is the Tower of Babel, the Migdal Babel, uh, the stronghold of mixture and confusion. And right in front of it is a graven image of a woman riding a bull 
A woman who's riding a beast, symbolic of the whore who rides the beast, the whore of Babylon, mystery of Babylon, who rides this scarlet Roman beast. Okay? This is symbolic of this, but this bull that she is riding is Zeus. If you look up information on Europe, you will find that the Europeans uh, got their name and, and, and openly admit this today. And the Europa is named after Europa, who was a young woman whom uh, Zeus manifested, their mighty one Zeus manifested, as a bull to, in which he seduced her, took her on his back, carried her away, raped her, and later made her the prince of, uh, I mean, the princess of some region over in Greece. And it escapes my mind which one at the moment. But anyway, Europa equates to Demeter, to Colombia, Easter, Hecate, who is the image of Colombia in Easter, uh, and also with Isis and Asheroth, who was mentioned in Scripture. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, but just to throw out this information about Europe, about the European Union and their plans. But this was, was uh, planned for mankind long ago, I mean long, long, long ago, but you can look in the Library of Congress and there is a map that you see in front of you. It is digital ID G3200CT001256 housed in Library of Congress Geography and Map Division in Washington, D.C. It is the New World Order map. And it was discovered by Helen Somers in a window in Philadelphia during World War II. It was completed in October 1941 before Pearl Harbor. And it was printed in color by a man named Maurice Gomberg in Philadelphia in 1942. It was displayed in his store window. When Helen Somers saw it, she immediately recognized how important it was, of course, a New World Order map. Uh, and she purchased several. At least a few original copies are in existence. Again, this one being in Washington, D.C. So, you see the significance. But, in the, at the bottom of this map, it promotes and proposes a list of ideas concerning World War II, which again, it was made a year before World War II, but the different ideas, these are, this is a, a brief summary of some of the thoughts. Uh, a new world order for permanent peace and freedom will be established at the end of the war. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean World War II, because if you read the writings of Albert Pike, the uh, so-called father of modern Freemasonry, you read that there was a plan that he had promoted and proposed to have three world wars, and again, this was... Uh, written in the 1800s before the First World War, and it was even reprinted again in a book before the First World War, in which she explicitly laid out in detail the first two World Wars and the Third World War using terms like uh, Nazism and uh, Zionism for World War II when it wasn't even being used in that way, you know. Uh, and then even telling us basically that World War III would be uh, conducted in such a way to make the Yahudim, the uh, true people of Yahuwah, wipe themselves out by, by fighting and feuding the, with the, uh, the Palestinians and the Arabs and the Islamic uh, uh, religion, and that basically Christians would feud against atheists and be killed by atheists, and that the Great War would be caused basically by our belief in scripture, but basically they were going to create a fake Zion, a fake uh, Israel, in which that they could convince all the nations of the world because of their spiritual beliefs, because again, these various nations like uh, America, for instance, has strong Christian uh, beliefs and sways politically towards Zionism. Now, I'm not talking about Zionism like scriptural Zionism, like keeping Torah and keeping scripture and calling on you who I'm talking about uh, political Zionism, which is taking Israel by force and not because of repentance and not because uh, Mashiach has returned or because uh, we're keeping Yahuwah's Torah, but because 
they want to create a secular state of Israel, which is against Torah, because there cannot be a secular state of Israel according to the words of the Most High. Okay, so they, what their idea and plan is to create this false Israel, this fake Israel, so that they could make the entire world go to war here and basically kill all those who believed in this particular way so that they can present and promote the Luciferian doctrine. And we, we're going to get some more into some of that anyway, but I just had to get that out there. That's the point of this, this uh, New World Order, uh, to establish permanent peace and freedom according to this map, says the USA must uh, altruistically assume the leadership of the newly established world order. So it believes that, that America must play a huge role in this new world order. The USA, Britain, and the USSR, which is Russia, will undertake to guarantee peace to the nations, which will be permanently disarmed and demilitarized. demilitarized. The USA will become invincible as a military, naval, and air power. The USSR, which is Russia, will acquire the republics of Eastern Europe after the war. There will be a demilitarized, federated, united states of Europe, which indeed we see in the European Union, which did not exist at this time. So we see that this has taken place. Canada, Mexico, Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean island, islands will be incorporated into the United States of America, which has been proposed in the idea of the North American Union, which the groundwork has already been laid, which our sovereignty has basically already been uh, signed away by our former president, George W. Bush. Uh, but you see... The uh, proposal of the North American Union, which I'm describing here, Canada, Mexico, and Central America, which is, uh, which you know, we're going to all be a part of here, that this was proposed to combine with the United States even as far back as 1941. But you see it on the European Union map again, and their division of the ten, uh, the ten regions. You also see it. Uh, and the proposal and, and other proposals. Uh, so there's there's just a, there's a whole lot of, of talk about America becoming a union with this in today's world that we live in now. The land of the ancient Hebrews, it says, known as Palestine and Transjordan, will be united as a demilitarized republic, and they said it would be called Hebrew land, which is. It sounds like an amusement park or something, Hebrew land. But this happened in 1948 with the assembling of the, the, the modern nation of Israel, which was basically uh, created because of the, time, the, uh, the struggle of, of the Yehudim that they went through the, uh, during the Holocaust in Nazi Germany under the, uh, the, the rule of Hitler, and which we'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit, but what you need to know about Hitler is Hitler was funded by the Roman Catholic Church. Hitler was funded by some of these people who were in the synagogue of Satan who claimed to be Yehudim Jews but are not, such as the Rothschilds and all these different individuals who today own most of the land of modern Israel, again, because the plan is according to Albert Pike, and according to these people, to create this land, to fabricate this land over there, so that they can basically create World War III, so that they can have the premise to usher in their false Messiah, because they're making a false Armageddon, a false uh, end-time war. So that's the whole point of, of this this idea that these people of the New World Order have to create Hebrew land or, or modern Israel where they fight and, and divide the land constantly and play around with Yahuwah's covenant land and try to uh, snare and bring on a snare to any of Yahuwah's remaining people who might see this revival of this land and be snared to go there and to fight in this false Armageddon that these international bankers and powers that be have manipulated to take place. 
It says all natural resources will be nationalized and distributed to all nations. So we're talking about share, okay? Talking about United Nations has different uh, groups associated associated with it with this idea of sharing, uh, worldwide sharing, global sharing. I know that sounds great, right? It sounds great, but you got to read the blueprints of what they're talking about uh, sharing. We're talking about socialism here. We're talking about enslavement, uh, all these different things, right? It says, banking, investments, railroads, and power plants will be nationalized everywhere. So we're talking about international banking. A world common monetary system, a world common monetary system, so one world currency. All right, this is, we're talking uh, Book of Revelation language, I mean, this whole way through here. Uh, New World Order, talking about one world common monetary system. And there's even information in this about population control and the creation of a world court. It's interesting that this proposal of dividing the world into ten regions was proposed by the Club of Rome, the Club of Rome now, on, 17, on the 17th of September, 1973, published in a report entitled The Regionalized and Adaptive Model of the Global World System, which was authored by Edouard Pestel and Mihailo Mezarevic. And again, remember, when it says that the beast tramples the whole earth, it's not kidding. It's talking about a one world government. It's talking about one world banking. It's talking about all these things proposed on this New World Order map. The dates to uh, 1941 housed in Washington, D.C. All right, now, remember I said we were going to wrap up Revelation 13. We stopped where it said that he who leads into captivity must be carried into captivity, and he who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. This is the endurance and belief of the set of part ones. And so we, we left off there, and we're going to pick up in Revelation 13. We're going to pick up in verse 11 now. So we just saw this beast rise up. He saw this beast, this conglomerate beast, this Roman beast, that's mixed up with all these different nations involved with all these different things. It's trying to create this, this, this new world order, this, all these different things. That's the, the plan, globalization. Babylon is in its heart. This is how it speaks out of its mouth. But then, in, in verse 11, it says, And I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns, like a lamb, and spoke like a dragon. Spoke like the devil. Spoke like the devil himself, right? Looks like a lamb. We know that Yahushua is the lamb of Yahuwah that takes away the sins of the whole earth. So we are talking about something that presents itself in the likeness, in the image of, of Yahushua, the people of the way, okay, who claim to be followers of the Messiah, right? And they have two horns, two political powers that rule over it, right? And it's interesting that Yahukan and John sees this, this beast rise up. At the time that he sees that the other beast, the Roman beast, had received a deadly wound and was healed, and, and he also saw that he who carries into captivity must be carried into captivity, which, again, the so-called uh, the, 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 the so Pope, right, the Poop, <laughs> was taken into France by Napoleon as prisoner, right? He was taken into captivity. So, at this time that he was taken into captivity, which we know was 1798, Right? That ended his 1260 year rule in 1798. Around this time, another beast comes up that looks and acts like it might be a follower of the Messiah. It has two ruling powers over it, two, two uh, rulers. And it speaks like a dragon. It says in verse 12, and it exercises all the authority of the first beast. Now the first beast's authority is its governing system, right? And the governing systems of Rome were ideas such as a republic. That's where we get the idea of what? A senate? That's where we get the ideas of democracy? 
These are all what? These are Roman authority? These are all Roman ways of rule? The ways to rule? Hmm. All these concepts are Roman. Who rose around the year 1798? Who has two ruling powers over it? like this and, and talks like the dragon and who is it that has a governing system and authority like unto Rome with a senate that calls itself a democracy but is really a republic hmm and it says, and he causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So this, this beast is going to tell us to worship the first beast? Hmm. It, it's going to, to uh, be a prophet for this beast? It's going to have open relations with the Vatican, open relations with Rome, be made in Rome's image and likeness. It comes into being around the year 1798 by interpretation, by fixed interpretation. We have only one nation, people that fit this description. That is the United States of America, which indeed was a plan and a plot to create a so-called new world from which they would be able to launch the, the, uh, the a beast that would promote the idea of a new world order from this new world. And who was sent to, uh, to uh, rule over this new world? Europeans. And they came from the beast. They brought their, the, the, the religion of the beast came with them. And and now we see that we also are ruled under a so-called democracy, which is, a, which is in actuality, when you research it, it's more like a republic. And again, we have the authority, we're ruled over, over by Roman authority, by Roman civil authority. You'll see pantheons in our nation's capital. Our nation's capital is named after a mighty one. It's called the District of Columbia. There is no distinction or difference between church and state. That is an illusion for the Christian mind to think that there is some type of difference between their mighty one and the mighty one uh, and, and the actual uh, uh, the actual dictates of policy within the government, but our government is openly religious in the ways of following after Satan. It, show, it, is, it has pantheons erected, uh, false mighty ones everywhere in Washington, D.C. All over the place, you'll see the images of jealousy, the obelisk. you see all these various things. You'll even see... Uh, Baal rising up out of the earth and different things all over, all over the places. It's just amazing the different things. And then it says that we call they cause all to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And we and this nation when the the so-called pope came over during the time of George W. Bush's uh, reign on in this land. That it, and when he was asked, when you look into this man's eyes, the so-called Pope, the rat singer, when you look into his eyes, what do you see? And he just says, I see God. You know, I, it, 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 the excitement was just palpable. The streets were lined with people that were so thrilled that the Holy Father was here. And it was such a privilege to welcome this good man to the United States. I, I, for those of you on the South Lawn Ceremony, who saw the South Lawn Ceremony live... It was what an unbelievable. It was just such a special moment, and um, and it was a special moment to be able to visit uh, with the Holy Father in the Oval Office. He is a humble servant of God. He is a brilliant professor. He is a warm and generous soul. He is uh, he is courageous in the defense of fundamental truths. His Holiness believes that freedom 
is the Almighty's gift to every man, woman, and child on earth. He understands that every person has value. Or to use, use his words, each of us is willed, each of us is loved, and each of us is necessary. And I'm going to remind his Holy Father how important his voice is in making it easier for politicians like me to be able to kind of stand and, and defend our positions that are, I think, you know, very important positions to take. Mr. President, final question. Yes, sir. You said famously, when you looked into Vladimir Putin's eyes, you saw his soul. Yeah. When you look into Benedict XVI's eyes, what do you see? God. Good way to end the interview. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Yes, sir. Thank you. And he told you, he told you, that's the man I worship. That's him. That's the beast. That's the one I bow down to. That's the one I kiss his hand. Again, that's what the word worship means. And all the American presidents, they bow to this man. They kiss his hand. They call him Holy Father. There is only one Kodesh or set apart Abba, or who, what is called Father. That is Yahuwah. This person has obtained a blasphemous name that blasphemes and lies. This is not a Protestant nation. The, the, when you look at the uh, White House, the White House is a replica of the house over in Vatican Square. And you see the obelisk, the George Washington Monument. You look over in St. Peter's Square in the Vatican, and there you have your phallic symbol. There you have your Egyptian symbol of Ra. And even over there on there, that, that steeple, that obelisk over in there, that little horn of Rome that stands in the midst of St. Peter's Square, and you look on its sides, you'll see graven images of Ra, their mighty one, and on top they got the T, the T, the, the sacred towel of their false mighty one, Tammuz. They tell on themselves. All right, so it says right here, it says in verse 13, and he does great signs so that he even makes fire come down from the heavens on the earth before men. And who has rained down more fire than the American government? Can we recall the atomic bomb that fell during the time of World War II in Japan? Can we remember all the devastation that has fallen and how all the people have seen this fire fall down from the sky? Now, a lot of people say that this beast here, now we know that beasts are nations. A lot of people say that this is a false prophet. And that the first beast is the anti-Messiah. And that this represents two people and not two nations or powers like I'm telling you now. That it represents two powers. And maybe, perhaps, it can be interpreted in the way that they're interpreting it. And, and that when the, the uh, beast receives a deadly wound, that, the, that this false messiah, this false... Uh, mighty one that's going to come and set himself up and say that he is the mighty one and all these different things, the man of perdition, uh, this, the, the man of lawlessness, that he is going to suffer some type of head wound and he's going to literally die and resurrect. And he might fulfill some type of crazy lying sign or wonder, just like Second Thessalonians uh, said that we read you know, earlier. However, this is saying, this is, this script, these scriptures are not talking about People, like on an individual basis, they're talking about beasts. So when people get down to this, this uh, one that looks like a lamb and speaks like a dragon, they say, well, this is the false prophet, and he makes fire fall down from the sky, just like the prophet Eliyahu, who they call Elijah, made fire fall down from the sky, which you're going to read about a little later. But so they see this, and they see, you know, all these things, so they say that this is actually, and, and yes, there might be a false prophet who arises, who does this very thing, and makes a false 
a, a you know fire fall down from the sky just so that he can claim to be you know the Lord the Baal and Baal didn't rain down any fire during the time of Aliyahu but Baal might rain down some kind of crazy fire from some you know whatever in the sky in these latter days to deceive men but really what it's talking about it's talking about a nation that makes fire fall down from the sky literally now I know that I mean this is this is this is as literal as it can get. And it says, And he leads astray those dwelling on the earth because of those signs which he was given to do before the beast, saying to those dwelling on the earth to make an image to the beast, pay close attention, who was wounded by the sword, yet lived. And there was given to him to give spirit, or ruach, to the image of the beast, and the image of the beast should both speak and cause to be killed as many as would not worship the image of the beast. And he causes all, both small and great and rich and poor and free and slave, to be given a mark upon their right hand or upon their foreheads. And that no one should be able to buy or sell except he that has the mark of or the name of the beast or the number of of his name. Here is the wisdom. He who has understanding, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. And we're going to get into the 666, and we're going to get into the mark of the beast, we're getting all these things in just a moment, but I have to point out that this, uh, this beast that I have said is the United States of America, which rose in 1776, and the papal government was received its deadly wound in 1798. That this beast makes fire fall down from the heavens. It's got two political powers, two horns on its head. It's going to make all men receive a mark. It's going to be a great missionizing uh, government. It's going to be a, a government that militarizes the world and pushes its religion and ideology and way of thinking upon the entire world. It's going to look like a, a lamb. They send out these Christian missionaries and all these things. It looks like a lamb. But these people speak like a dragon. They bring blasphemous names, false names, false revelations, and lawlessness, and all these various things. And they make these people worship after the papal government. But Notice what it says here, that this nation, America, this nation that looks like a lamb, that speaks like a dragon, that it creates an image unto the first beast. And again, even if you don't believe what I'm saying, that this nation is America, you have, the other nations, they have, they, I explicitly showed and explained in great detail how we know how that that, that, that nation, the first nation, is the revival of the Roman Empire. So we know that for a fact. So what does it mean if a nation, such as America or any nation that looks like a lamb and speaks like a dragon, what, how does it make an image unto a beast, unto a nation? Well, if you look at this nation, the nation has seven heads. It's got many heads, right? It's got ten horns. It now has proposed to create a new world order in which it will encompass the whole world and then it will be they, the whole world will be made into its likeness so how would a nation create an image to make this happen this is how the nation would make it happen it would be a false prophet to propose and to push the new world order it would be the nation that makes the new world order come into be the nation that gives power unto the new world order because if you make the new world order you would have made an image a likeness unto the european beast the roman beast which is the conglomerate beast the model beast that shows us the mixture and confusion of all the previous beasts that persecuted the people of the Most High and ruled over them, if you look at America's presidents, they have thoroughly pushed the agenda of a new world order. You can see so many people throughout the ages have proposed this idea of the new world order. The idea of a new world order is on the back of the American dollar bill. 
There's a lot of things on the back of the dollar bill, but in Latin you see Nuevos Ordo Seclorum, which means New Order of the Ages. And you see it around the all-seeing eye of Horus, which is Satan. We're going to talk about all these, th all these things a little further. But it's basically creating a image unto the beast. And at the bottom of the pyramid, you see the year 1776 in Roman numerals. And again, I'm going to talk some more about all what that means, but I'm just showing you that these, these correlations, also you see the Imperial Eagle of Rome that usually sits on top of our flagpoles which holds the world by its talons which was a manifestation of Zeus in Rome so it is a mighty one on our dollar bill made in the image and likeness of Zeus again we are pushing and we are showing all the authority of the former beast, the Roman beast in this nation, America and they are pushing this global agenda Globalization can be read about in the magazines, the newspapers, the headlines, and all the news media is talking about globalization, especially here in America. Our presidents continuously preach the sermon of the New World Order. So, now I know a lot of people with their interpretation of the beast, again, they default to the interpretation that the first beast is just simply the anti-Messiah, the second beast being the false prophet, and somehow the false prophet is going to create a literal image, like a clone or something, unto the anti-Messiah, who they see as the first beast. And, and maybe this could happen. It's kind of interesting that in ancient Jewish mysticism, um, in the occult practices of Kabbalah, there is actually a story of a particular so-called rabbi that creates a molten image, which well, he actually a graven image of clay, and which he invokes the powers of Ashtaroth, who's mentioned in Scripture, and we're going to talk about further in Scripture, but it's dark powers. There was a movie made about this, and he invokes these, these entities, and he takes the name of Yahuwah and rolls it up and sticks it in the mouth of this thing, but this thing has a hexagram put on it and all these various symbols, in which the spirit of Ashtaroth comes into this thing, this dark devil spirit of Ashtaroth comes into this thing, and so supposedly this golem, this graven image, saves the, the people of Israel during the Middle Ages and is a Messiah-type figure. Okay, so I could see where people could come to a conclusion there's going to be some type of witchcraft involved as some type of sleight of hand magic to make some type of physical image or manifestation of this man, the little horn, in the last days, the great and final anti-Messiah. I could see how somebody could see that, and I'm not going to say that they would be wrong in seeing that and saying that could happen. It could be a dual interpretation. I could definitely see a dual interpretation because there's history to support that witchcraft in Jewish mysticism and thought has pushed this type of idea. So I can see that. However, the literal interpretation though of this is in fact that the beast, the beast that looks like a lamb, speaks like a dragon, when it creates an image unto the beast, it is creating something that looks just like that beast, something that looks just like that nation, made after the likeness of that nation. That nation Again, being Rome, Rome divided into ten toes, and now America proposes in the New World Order map to divide the world into ten provinces, which would do what? 
give life and breath unto the image of the beast which they are trying to create, which is the Nuevos Ordo Seclorum, the new order of the ages, the new world order. That is the image and likeness of the beast that all the people will worship and serve. And through that means they will receive a name. And most of the people have already received a name. And that name is the mark of the beast. And it is equivalent to 666, which we are about to look at in even further depth. But just keep all these things in mind, that the mark of the beast is a blasphemous name that is attributed to a blasphemous name. And there are all these blasphemous names that are proposed by the people for our Messiah, Yahushua, and for his Abba, Yahuwah, who is our Savior, which is what Yahushua means. So this, in fact, Yahushua, being the image of Yahuwah, he is the opposite of the image of the beast. Yahushua is a rock with, that has been cut out without hands. who's going to smite the image. The image is an image of an idol worship. An image of Babylonian mixture and confusion. Yahushua is the, uh, the Torah Messiah. The true, uh, the true pure and kadosh one who is not made an image of pagan idolatry. He is made. He is made in the image of Yahuwah. He is the image of Yahuwah. He was not made with hands. He existed in the beginning. He was in the beginning. The scripture says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Elohim. That word, word in the Aramaic Milta means manifestation, and it means word. And he is the manifestation of the word, the Aleph and Tal, that was in the beginning with Elohim, in the very first line of Bereshith, Genesis, which means in a beginning. Bereshith, bara, in a beginning, created Elohim, at, which is Aleph Tal, the first and last letter, which people have called him the Alpha and the Omega, but he did not speak Greek. He was an Abrim Messiah. He was from the tribe of Yahudah. Hallelujah. And the scriptures record, even in the Greek New Testament, that he spoke in the Hebrew tongue, and he revealed his name to Shaul, who is called Paul, on the road to Damascus, in the Hebrew tongue. So he is the Aleph and Tal. So in the beginning created Aloha, uh, Elohim, the Aleph and the Tal, hallelujah, because that Aleph and Tal was with him in the beginning. He used that Aleph Tal, that word, to create all things. He used it to create the heavens and the earth, as it says in the very first line, hallelujah.